This is Art Sense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with author Mark Palazzotti about his new book, Why Surrealism Matters, which chronicles the philosophies and milestones of the iconic 20th century movement. In the conversation, Mark describes the lasting impact that the surrealist worldview has had on societies worldwide, as well as its ability to transform minds still today. And now, a conversation about the enduring legacy of surrealism with author Mark Palazzotti. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Art Sense podcast. Uh, Mark, you are the author of a new book, Why Surrealism Matters. And uh, I just completed reading the book, and I have so many questions. And I'm just trying to think where to start. A lot of times I, I start with a hypothetical, which is, say you're sitting uh, at a dinner party next to someone who has no idea you know, what you do. Uh, mm-hmm. And you mentioned that you just completed writing a book called Why Surrealism Matters. They're going to ask you to answer that question for yourself, aren't they? Yeah, why does surrealism matter? Um, great question. Tough tough one to answer, even though it seems like a perfectly straightforward one. I guess the way that I would answer it is to think back about uh, to what got me interested in writing this to begin with, uh, which was trying to, which was noticing that... Um, there has been a real resurgence of interest in surrealism uh, over the last five, six years. And part of the question was simply, why is that? Uh, you know, of course, there are many art movements. Um, but one thing that occurs to me is that unlike movements like Impressionism or Cubism or Fauvism, where there are a lot of really visually stunning works, the reality is that there are there are some surrealist masterpieces, but there's also a lot of work that you know is frankly fairly inconsequential, mm-hmm. and I don't know that um, that that in itself carries the interest a hundred years later. So what that led me to was the notion that it really is less about the art or the writing or the particular productions. It's really about the ideas underlying all of it. Um, it's about the it's about surrealism as a way of life. And of course, you know, you could say part of this is the fact that we are about to, this is now the 100th anniversary, uh, the the official launching of the movement, if you want to date it, was in um, 1924, on October 24, with, with the publication of Under Breton's first Surrealist Manifesto. Um, so that, of course, is one easy answer, but I think it goes beyond that. I think it goes into more how people are seeing the world and how the way the Surrealists saw the world uh, is is um, feeling very relevant. Uh, you know, it. it I, I don't know that we can necessarily look to them for answers so much as ways of reframing the questions. But it occurred to me as well that the a number of the issues that they were dealing with are actually fairly similar to some of the things we're dealing with today, a hundred years later. You know, they had just come out of a pandemic, the nineteen eighties, the nineteen eighteen Spanish flu. They had just come out of a world war. Well. You know, sadly, as we speak, uh, we're we're under the shadow of that now. Um, but the part of it that actually is interesting and that I have to keep reminding myself about is that neither of those considerations had actually happened when I started pitching this book, uh, when I got the idea for it. Uh, this book was first mentioned to Yale University Press, my publisher, in 2019. There was no COVID yet. There was no conflict in the Middle East. Russia had not invaded Ukraine. So all of the things that I can look at and say, look at these correspondences, my gosh, we're going through a similar moment in a number of ways, hadn't actually happened. And yet somehow there was something in the air that suggested, not just to me, but to to people I was seeing around me, that surrealism had something very much of the moment to say. Um, that's a very long and convoluted answer to your question. No, and I, it, I don't no, know if it actually no, does it, answer it. But. it it's great. And... and uh... It sounds like you didn't even realize you were skating to the puck, right? Mm, exactly. But I think that's part of it. You know, I think that that's part of why I, I think it, it's that sensitivity to to the zeitgeist, to the atmosphere, to, you know, to what's going on, even to a point that we don't necessarily even recognize that is what is so fascinating and fundamental about surrealism. 
You know, I think one of the things that that kind of strikes me right away in the first fourth of the book, halfway through the book, certainly by the time I get to the end of the book, is very quickly my impression of what I thought surrealism was or is was really a challenge because, you know, I always kind of put it in a box that had, you know, visual images uh, from, you know, Dali and Magritte. And you think of uncanny, you think of, you know, dreamlike atmospheres. But that was at the very best, at the very surface of it all, right? Below it, it was, it was really about uh, a philosophy, a worldview. And mm -hmm. that philosophy and worldview was really spearheaded by by one person, right? They're, they're, they had a, a very specific bell cow, correct? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you are... First of all, you're absolutely not wrong um, in thinking in terms of, you know, Dali and Magritte and you know, some of the famous writings. I mean, these were these were their calling cards. Um, you know, surrealism made its impact via art, via writing, via um, film, you know, uh, and still today, you know, we call certain producers of various art forms surrealists, David Lynch being a classic example, um, you know, certain writers, certain painters. Um, but you're also absolutely right in saying that, and this was this was one of the things I was trying to bring across the most, is that these works were meant as ways of conveying an idea, conveying a philosophy, conveying a way of living in the world, of being in the world. Um, you know, surrealism started off largely as a reaction against the rationalist society in which they were living in the early 20th century, which they held, they meaning the the original members who sort of gathered together to loosely form this group that they held responsible for things like world war one in which a number of them had served uh which left them completely um horrified of course and they held uh responsible not just the political system but the entire mental structure of how the western world worked by when i say western world of course i'm talking largely about france but you know we western europe and they blamed centuries of what we would call greco-latin logic um you know the the logic in which uh, uh they had all been educated as being the the um the root of all evil uh and so when you talk about dreamlike atmospheres or their experiments with the unconscious or their experiments with sleep states or automatic writing or you know some of the some of the uh, automatic painting or you know some of the, the visual um juxtaposition the jarring visceral juxtapositions that they try to put forth what they're really trying to do is to shake people up and get them to understand that there's another way that one can look at the world. It doesn't have to be this mainstream rationalist um, uh, uh, worldview. And and the reason for that is very simply, you know, how, how what has this done for us? Look at what it's done for us. You know, it, it, it's, it's not working. We need something else. Um, this is also why they eventually became involved um with the french communist party uh and and tried to have an active political engagement because ultimately the goal was to um as breton said to to uh, revamp society and and human understanding from top to bottom and you know that's a large project uh and they saw the the communists or the leftists as one avenue toward this um of course they were talking at cross purposes from almost day one because the communists were a political party and they had a very specific social economic agenda uh that was their goal uh, understandably and the surrealists had they were not politicians they didn't have a, a cab you know they didn't have a platform they didn't have a uh, uh you know a series of, of concrete um uh goals that they wanted to um uh impose or that they you know once, once the revolution happens we're going to do this and this and that they were much more interesting in knocking it down and, and the revolution happening um but that said one of the areas that is um that I found really fascinating and is one of the thorniest areas to try to parse in their relationships with the Communist Party is that the communists kept saying to them, you know, that's all great, but it's it's very idealistic. Like we can talk about avant-garde literature and art once the revolution has happened and we have imposed the dictatorship of the proletariat, whatever it might be. These, you know, what you're talking about are post-revolutionary problems. And the surrealist answer is there is no such thing as a post-revolutionary problem because if you don't address these issues now, all you're going to end up doing is replacing one power structure with the same basic power structure under different names. But it doesn't get you very far because until you have actually changed the way people think and the way people are are in the world and the way their their mental 
uh, uh, attitudes work. You know, we've seen this. It just it's just replacing one one government with another that that won't get you anywhere. So it's it's an interesting problem because you can see both sides of it. Um, you know, from the from the from the politician's point of view, all of this you know highfalutin avant-garde literature seems kind of frivolous to somebody who's tr struggling to put food on the table or is dealing with a you know a politically repressive regime and trying to stay out of jail. I get it, and at the same time, I also understand the, the surrealist point of view, saying you know it's that's important. And the workers' conditions is important, but really deep down, what they wanted to do was get people to just think in a totally different way. You're right. Surrealism it just keeps bubbling back up. And I was I was listening to a conversation the other day uh, with a curator Maria Elena Ortiz, who curated a show at the Modern Art Museum in Fort Worth that's currently going on uh, called Surrealism and Us Caribbean and African Diasporic Artists since mm -hmm. 1940. So it's about how surrealism spread to the, the Caribbean and African influenced nations that were related to French colonialism. And one of the interesting things she was saying in the conversation was what surrealism shared with these societies. And if we think of somebody like Haiti, the thought that uh, a nation like Haiti a nation of, of slaves on a plantation can rise up against a colonial power like France. You know, what's shared there is somewhere somebody started believing in the impossible, mm -hmm. you know, changing the, the whole framework, you know, to have a revolution, someone needs to start reconsidering impossibilities as being being possible. Uh, the old adage about keeping fleas in a jar with a lid and they'll bounce off the lid. And once you re re remove the lid, they won't jump past uh, the top of the jar. The surrealists were, were sort of challenging people to think outside of the jar, right? Yeah. And Haiti is a, is a, a great example because, um, you know, as you know from the book, uh, Breton spent some time there uh he was sent actually on an official mission during his uh, exile in the united states during the second world war um and happened to coincide with the haitian revolution that deposed uh Elulesco, the, the president of course there were people who said afterward you know essentially you sparked the haitian revolution and his answer to that was don't be ridiculous you know of course i didn't it was it was the conditions there that had been building up for years and there's no it's no surprise that the haitian people rose up but there were a number of students who um had been at his the talks that he gave or the cafe sessions that he had with them and they said you know sure it's not it was not andre breton's visit to haiti that suddenly caused this this revolution to happen but the fact that he would talk about things like freedom and personal liberty and political freedom in this kind of context was a revolutionary act and it did help spark the impetus and in fact i think as i recall one of the things that one of the things that lit the, the put the match to the fuse was um the fact that a student newspaper inspired by having been to a lecture that breton gave wrote an article that was a little bit you know somewhat aggressive uh about the about the power structure and it was shut down and then there was a protest against that and these things you know just sort of snowball and several days later you've got this this massive writing so you know um uh, i mean I've, ha I've had these conversations with people who know much much more about haiti and the situation than i ever will uh and you know many of them say look it was it was a pretty minor incident and i and i believe that that is true but i don't think it was inconsequential um and and by the by the testimony of people who were actually there and who were personally implicated and personally involved, you know, there was some um, value, some weight to Breton's presence and the words that he spoke there and the the ideals of surrealism that he was promoting and even discussing um, at that moment. Uh, another one is uh, Martinique, where he um, stopped over on his, he and his, his wife and daughter stopped over um, en route to the United States at the beginning of the war uh, when he when he left France. And that's where he discovered and made contact with uh, Aimé and Suzanne Césaire, who were the um, two young poets. Um, and uh, eventually Césaire became a major political figure uh, in, in Martinique. Um, but they too, you know, uh, their, their attraction to surrealism and their attraction to what Breton was saying 
had much less to do with things like, you know, uh, uh, automatic writing and the dream states and, and some of the things that, you know, the people sometimes look at as just parlor games. They were interested specifically in the anti-colonialist stance, uh, which went back to the 1920s. Uh, they were interested in the political statements. They were interested in the, you know, in the, in the promotion of, of revolutionary ideals. So, you know, there again, people take and pick and choose but it was all part of the same message, uh, ultimately, and and it, and these things were important. You know, they did they did have an effect. You write uh, about how their philosophy influenced the way they were literally seeing the world. I mean, it's like they were walking down the street trying to find random connectedness and marvels and the extraordinary in in the everyday and looking for those things that are happening just outside our notice, which which seem kind of spiritual. And it feels like it, it almost touches on the psychedelic. And it, it th there's a point in that chapter where you're talking about it, where it really begins to sound a lot like Timothy Leary and turn on, tune in, drop out. Especially when you, you think about what they were trying to accomplish. They, they are, um, by most accounts, anti-work. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd be curious to kind of compare and contrast that. And, you know, I mean, Leary and uh, those experiments with LSD were happening at the height of the Vietnam War, which is mm -hmm. just as a tumultuous time as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have right now. And if you, it doesn't take much digging in our headlines right now to hear high tech venture capitalists and billionaires talking about microdosing of psychedelics or ketamine or what I mean it's it's interesting to see parallels I think it's no coincidence that one of the peak points of resurgence of interest in surrealism certainly in this country but not only in this country was in the 1960s the late 1960s um you know the period around 67 68 um because it was very much the same quest and it was also the same kind of social political pressure cooker situation you know you had the vietnam war as you said um you know you had nixon which you know given who we have today maybe doesn't seem like such an awful guy but you know in 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 my day and age when i was you know when i was a teenager back then he was he was villain number one um you know uh, sadly he's been superseded but um but you know it 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 makes perfect sense to me that there would be these experiments going on uh you know in france of course you had may 68 uh, which was you know which was very explicitly uh beholden to surrealism and to the point where some of the slogans that the students scrawled on the walls were actual statements from surrealist texts and surrealist poems i mean they were very aware of the fact that they were harking back to some of these surrealist ideals in their in their own protest um and similar things happened here with you know with timothy leary and with with experiments in psychedelics um you know as it happens, um, the Surrealists, by and large, were not major drug experimenters. Uh, I mean, some were. Uh, Arto, uh, Antonin Arto, of course, was a, was a big believer in peyote. There were some others who, who did. But um, uh, André Breton, who was, you know, really still the kind of the spiritual leader and the, and the guide for, 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 for most of them, at least in the Paris group, didn't like drugs. Uh, you know, he didn't, he didn't do drugs. I think there's one episode where he tried... I forget it was pot or cocaine or something as an experiment and was completely useless for the rest of the day. And you know, I'm not going to do this again. Um, but, you know, but what they were looking for in, in uh, you know, in the marvels of everyday life was not that different from what you can induce with, with um, mind altering substances. And the point of this was to get people out of the mind numbing sameness and dullness and brain deadening uh, qualities that they saw around them in our you know modern capitalist society um one of the statements in the back in the first manifesto that Breton talks about is that one of the goals of surrealism is to reconnect with the wonder of childhood this moment when you know at least ideally speaking this moment when everything is kind of wondrous and everything is new and everything is is you know is discovery and 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 you know your 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 wow buttons are on it every minute um and I don't know that that's all that different really from somebody trying LSD or trying, you know, or, or experimenting with pot or trying an alternative lifestyle or whatever it might be. You know, people people have, have their ways of trying to cope with this, but the ultimate goal was, again, how do you get outside of that stultifying day-to-day -day gray reality that 
that the world, our society, Western society, then and now, seems so hell bent on trying to impose on us um, as a way of control, as a way of you know keeping you from thinking about other things, whatever it might be. Another part of the worldview uh, of the surrealist that comes back under more examination in this era is their relationship with the female, mm -hmm. right? Whether that's, you know, hypersexualization or what was the role of the female voice in their group. And, you know, you, in the book, you, you touch on this whole dilemma of women as theory versus women as members of the group. Can you talk a little bit more about trying to reconcile how they felt about females as subject matter and also as members of their group? Yeah, it's it's one of the thornier aspects, as you could imagine. Um, it's it's complex. Um, so on the one hand, you could say that surrealists, like many other male dominated art movements, uh, objectified women. They certainly had you know a number of women's bodies depicted in various sexualized ways, um, sometimes in ways that could seem quite misogynistic or sadistic. Um, uh, you know, and that's the, that's just a fact. Uh, and the reality is that the group was largely dominated by men. Um, you know, uh, they were men of a particular generation and time. Uh, you know, they'd all more, mostly been born right around the turn of the 20th century. Um, even though on paper they might promote a certain um, equality or a certain liberation or, you know, a certain what we would almost call proto-feminist ideals, in reality it was hard for them to get through uh, some of their own innate prejudices and fears and insecurities. And you really see it in the way that some of them talk about sex, especially in their more private conversations. Um, you know, some of them are just scared to death. And um, and it's, it's uh, I, I talk in the book about this series of conversations that they had over a period of about three or four years toward the late twenties, beginning of the thirties, uh, called the the inquiries on sexuality. And they're basically a bunch of guys getting together and you know trying very genuinely and very sincerely to come to grips with all these taboo subjects, you know. And they'll talk about sexuality and they'll talk about masturbation and they'll talk about fantasy they'll talk you know all these and, and threesomes and all these other things but underneath it all there's this sort of sense that these guys are kind of naive you know in a way it's i mean it's not banter it's not like braggadocio but it's 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 coming from a place where you can see that they're not you know all that informed and there is this one i love this moment there was one of the few sessions where a woman actually did attend and she listened for a while and said, you, know, you boys need to learn a few things. Uh, you know, I mean, she, she got it. Um, you know, but I think it's also, I think one has to be also careful not to just dismiss them as a bunch of, you know, patriarchal misogynists. Um, because I think that there was a genuine desire to offer women an alternative path to the one that French society was offering by and large at the time which was a very, you know, traditional home, wife and mother kind of path, um, that it did recognize the creative um, potential and the creative, the creative uh, impetus uh, among a number of women. And, you know, as has been pointed out by a number of women scholars, the Surrealist group over time included far more women in its ranks as active members than pretty much any other, almost any other art movement, uh, certainly at the time. So, you know, I think it's, it's, it's easy to point to the objectification. It's easy to point to the fact that some women did indeed feel marginalized or, um, you know, as if they were there, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily as window dressing, but, you know, but their, 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 their um, contributions weren't as valued as, as some of the men's not arguing. But there were a number of others who also said, you know, had it not been for this, I would not have found myself. It offered me possibilities, whether within the group or after, you know, having been part of it and then moved on into their own careers and doing their own things. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I don't think that they would have had, uh, had it, had it not been for surrealism. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky, but I think it's, it's important to be, um, to be more subtle about it than maybe some, uh, 
some scholars have been. It's interesting, too, because as far as I can see, the tide is shifting a little bit. There was a period in the 90s, especially, where it was very much, it seemed to be very much along the lines of, you know, the surrealists were a bunch of machos and they really trod on these women and that's all there was. And um, it's interesting to see some people interviewing some of the women artists who had been part of the movement. Uh, I'm thinking of, in particular of this one interview with Merritt Oppenheim, who's the creator of the famous fur covered cup and saucer, uh, right. which is incidentally one of the most, I mean, with Dali's melted watches is probably the most iconic surrealist object there is. Yeah. Um, and the interviewer was basically trying to push her to say, you know, that, that she was downtrodden and that they, you know, suppressed her. This and, that. and she basically kept saying, like, no, you know, it's like, you know, at a certain point, I didn't need it anymore. And I went off and did my own thing. But it was really important to me. Um, so it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to have both points of view. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a mix of all. You know, you mentioned the term sadistic in terms of representation. And uh, it reminds me that you know some of these places that breton and the surrealists were drawing from you know included you know freud's writing which mm -hmm. has a tendency to really skew sexual but also marque de sade mm -hmm. obviously it's it's stimulating their their imagination but they really have an attraction for the taboo right yeah. i mean it, it the, you know that's it's almost like the the sledgehammer that they're using to kind of crack open, you know, uh, people's minds is the taboo. They were not subtle. Um, they were masters of, you know, of, of like I pointed out in the book, of, of what we now consider contemporary advertising and publicity techniques. I mean, they, they had it down. Um, and indeed, one of the weapons one of the tools that they used was was the taboo was was shock um and you know so one can look at the marquis de sade for example as being um this kind of exemplar of you know of misogyny and cruelty and and, and all of that i mean against women and and men um but for the surrealists i think it was really more his taboo value it was the shock value it was the fact that he was you know the proscribed author par excellence you know his works were and I maybe still are, you know, in the in the so-called hell section of the of the National Library, uh, you had to get you know special dispensation from the Pope to be able to see them for years and years. Um, and um, you know that that was the interest of it. It was the fact that he had so vehemently pushed back against the taboos of his time. Part of this also was, you know, this was a cry of um, of, of of fury, uh, you know, of, of, of anger. I mean, he's been practically half his adult life in jail uh, under one regime or the other, whether it was the king or whether it was the revolution. And, uh, you know, the guy basically felt he had nothing to lose. Uh, you know, he was also somewhat unbalanced, but that's a whole other story. In the book, you you talk a little bit about, you know, you talk a lot about the, the legacy of surrealism. Um, and, but one, one of those uh, pillars or branches is uh, is dark humor mm -hmm. and kind of uh, that the advent of of dark humor and you know and I think a lot of the the you know and, and now that I start thinking about it a, lo a lot of where we start seeing dark humor emerge in popular media does sort of go back to that time period of 1968 69 you know and can you, can you kind of talk about talk about that aspect and how the those two are kind of closely aligned yeah um i mean breton so the notion of of what he called black humor um which was what we call dark humor today <laughs> excuse me uh was uh goes back to the 1930s um uh, breton eventually published uh, an anthology of black humor uh which was uh, an anthology of writings going uh, international going from jonathan swift all the way up to you know the, the mid 20th century um, and including people like Kafka and Saad, obviously, and, um, you know, any number of others uh, known and, and less known, uh, who all epitomize this kind of very dis disturbing, somewhat cruel at times. Um, you know, I wouldn't call it exactly, it's certainly not mirthful, it's not funny haha -ha in that sense, but there's something that kind of tickles you at the same time. It's sort of you know, with, uh, to varying degrees, it can either make you laugh or not, but there's something that's that's sort of getting you a little agitated um, in, in the way that humor can. Um, 
And you, you know, at the time, this was a fairly new and unusual approach to what humor was. You know, humor was was really about conviviality. It was about bringing people together. Um, the surrealist notion of humor is is much more alienating. It's like a, you know, as I said, it's like a time bomb, you know, about going off. It derives a lot from Freud uh, and uh, jokes in their relation to the unconscious. Um, and it, you know, is trying to trace this, again, this kind of notion of marvel in the sense of, you know, something disquieting, something disturbing, something that kind of pulls you outside of yourself um, in, in the same way that, you know, that, that fabulous coincidences could do or some of the other things we talked about before, dream states. Um, this is yet another aspect of that. And if you want to talk about a way in which surrealism is really infused our contemporary life, you know, it's almost impossible now to see, for me, to see, you know, a series on Netflix or, you know, or, 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 or kids cartoons even. I mean, when my, you know, my son was growing up back in the 1990s, um, you know, I look at some of the cartoons he was looking at and thinking, my God, this is surrealism. You know, these, these, it, it was the, the kind of, uh, very, uh, um, uh, attitude soaked brand of humor uh is sort of dark a little bit off kilter you know um not so much funny in the way that you know certainly not like dick van dyke show funny it was you know it was a very different <laughs> different um uh attitude and and it continues to today you know in, in in a number of films um you know and you're right i mean the late 60s you certainly had i mean bunuel was was really you know making some of his his most impressive films uh jodorowsky was was uh start just starting out around then uh with those uh, films that you know like magic mountain and others that are considered to be real high high watermarks of, of surrealist cinema um mm -hmm. You know others as well so it's it's uh you know that is an aspect that i think that and and advertising and certain kinds of visuals are areas where surrealism has just become so it's become so infused with surrealism that we don't even notice it anymore you know again uh, surrealism just seems to have become part of our everyday vernacular you know, especially with the advent of AI, people visually are are, are thinking in terms of surrealism and trying to. Uh, it's almost like they're they're asking the computer, "Help me break my limitation of what I can imagine." So, I mean, I guess that's reinforcing our our thesis that surrealism is still relevant. It it is, but I would be careful with that, and I'll tell you why. Um... First of all, the Surrealists had a very ambiguous relationship to technology and science. They were not great believers in scientific advance. I mean, of course, the world goes on very aware of that. They certainly use the you know the telephone like anybody else. Um, but things like the space race and certain you know what they saw on that was the very real potential that many people at the time did not recognize of oppression as well. Um, and it's interesting to see there's a quote that I have in the book uh, from the mid 1960s, where they're talking about um, a, a surrealist, a later generation surrealist is, is responding to a critique by uh, Guy Debord of the Situationist International, where uh, Debord was sort of damning the surrealists for being a bunch of old fogies who didn't understand the, you know, the liberating potential of new technology. And their answer was, be careful what you wish for, because it also has a very different application. And, you know, of course, now that that needs no explanation whatsoever. Um, you know, when it comes to AI, I, I, I have asked myself the question many times what they would have thought of it. But the one thing that I would say is that, um, well, two things. I, I, my suspicion is that they would not be particularly keen, because one of the things that AI does or can do is to remove from you the person the burden of having to come up with these things yourself except that that's the point you know um coming up with these things yourself making that effort and discovering who you are and what you can come up with is really the point much more than the than the result you know ai is very results oriented it can give you you know i can tell it today write me a manifesto in the style of breton that's never been done before and you'll have a you know manifesto number four right there in front of your eyes but what is that really what what is that telling me you know what what have i really learned there um and the other thing about it is that and this is why i go back to my statement that some of my colleagues would probably hate me for about there being an awful lot of derivative or let's say mediocre or less than stellar surrealist art and writing and, and productions because it's not that hard to 
mimic or copy the style. Right. But surrealism is not about a style. And this is one reason why it's extremely difficult to really define, for example, what surrealist art is, because it goes anywhere from the, you know, the hyper realism of somebody like Dali to these weird kind of abstract forms that somebody like Yves Tanguy painted to complete abstractions that, you know, some of the surrealist artists of the 1940s were doing. I mean, you look at these things and they have absolutely nothing to do with each other visually, formally. And yet they are informed by, in the best of cases, by a spirit that has to do with that philosophy and that way of living in the world and that way of looking at the world and those mental processes that we were talking about. Uh, Breton in the in Surrealism and Painting says that he sees a painting as a window and to him, then, the real question is, what does that window look out on? Um, so it doesn't really matter what's actually in the in the in the in the canvas, you know, in, in uh, between in the frame. It's what what are you seeing through that into? And if it's interesting, great. And it could look like anything. And it could be, you know, he 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 liked he, he liked Dali. Obviously, he liked Paolo Uccello. He liked you know like a lot of a lot of classical and, and Renaissance and medieval works because they had that particular quality to them. Whereas others that. One would say, oh, this is, you know, this is kooky. This is surrealist. You'll love it. It was just whatever, you know, it, it just wasn't that interesting because there was no spirit there. There was no thought. So I have a feeling that with AI, you know, what you would get would be a lot of derivative stuff. Just hearing you talk through that, it makes me think that there's a certain amount of art that is purely abstract, abstract expressionist that probably lends itself to that definition of the the thought process of surrealism. I'm going to make a painting that is objectively of nothing, about nothing. In my mind, there are artists that have been making through the lens of a surrealism ideal without really being labeled as surrealist because we think of surrealism as something that's you know, object A mm -hmm. uncannily stuck on object B. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if we start talking about what, what were the ideals that Breton wrote about, it really forms a foundation for abstraction, right? Uh, absolutely. And, and on top of which, there is a, an actual historical relationship between the two because um, a number of the Abex painters were either in contact with or even sometimes taught by um, some of the surrealist artists who had come to New York during World War II. Um, I'm thinking of Roberto Mata was one. Um, I think Gordon Oslo Ford was one. You know, especially the ones who could get around in English and were able to integrate themselves more into the artistic milieu of what was going on in the States. It happens to coincide with the moment where Abex was beginning to take form and these ideas were beginning to circulate. And so there really is a quite a, you know, I wouldn't say that one derives from the other necessarily, but there was really a there's affiliation there. There, there are there are definitely lines of connection between the two, and part of that I think does have to do, as you said, with the thought process um, behind it and what it is that one is trying to express, regardless of the form that it takes. And that's why, you know, as I say in the book, uh, critics like Clement Greenberg, as far as I'm concerned, sort of missed the point because they're looking at some of these surrealist paintings, especially some of the American surrealists who, you know, who sort of cottoned on to this um, and were producing work that, as I said, was all form and no spirit and looking at them and, you know, looking at them formally and saying, there's not a whole lot here. It's kind of kitsch, you know, and he wasn't wrong, but he didn't entirely get what was supposed to be happening there. I, I spent a lot of time talking to people about art. I spent a lot of time studying art. You know, I love learning. I don't know if I should be ashamed that I hadn't read, you know, Breton's manifesto, hadn't gone deep on surrealism to really understand understand it as a worldview and a philosophy. But uh, I appreciate you helping me uh, be better informed about surrealism so that uh, I can get past a melting clock. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that because that you know, if there was any real hope and and goal for this book, it was. You know, of course, people don't know. They're, you're not born knowing this stuff, and and you know, the world of surrealism scholarship is pretty small when you get down to it. Um, and if I can inspire someone to learn a little bit more, then then I've done my job. So thank you for saying that. I appreciate it, Mark. I I really appreciate the time you've taken today to have this conversation about surrealism in your book, why surrealism matters. 
published by Yale Books and available, I believe, just about anywhere someone gets their books. I hope so. <laughs> so, Mark, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for, for being here. Craig, well, thank you very much for the invitation. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Awesome. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening. Thank you.